Good morning. It's good to see each of you here today and appreciate you coming out and worshiping together and uh, proud to be a part of this time that we can come and worship our Lord. Week before last, uh, Andy and I kind of, we didn't preach on the same thing, but on the same theme, uh, and, uh, Andy preached on, uh, almost called you Randy. <laughs> Uh, Randy, Andy preached on uh, the war within, and then I preached on the, the, the war without, talking about how do we deal with, with people who are seeking to persecute us and how do we react to them. And, it, and I thought a logical conclusion to that was uh, what Paul stated in Romans chapter 8 about the, the fight that we're fighting and the fight that we've already won and that we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. So I wanted to spend some time in talking about what, what Paul meant in those verses as we deal with this idea of being more than conquerors. As we begin, let's read our text from Romans chapter 8. Verse 37, where Paul said, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So what does he mean? When you, when you think of a conqueror, who do you think of? Maybe it's an old movie that you saw or, or something that you studied in school, but for the people that Paul was speaking to, they knew exactly what he was talking about because they saw the triumphs. There in Rome, they, they saw the, the great generals of the Roman army coming back and descending upon Rome and, and walking and or galloping through the, the big arches that were built in their honor. As they came back, they could hear the, the clanking of the armor and as the chariots rolled over the cobblestone streets of the city of Rome, they could see that great and mighty conqueror standing at the head of his army. They saw the captives that returned with that army. They saw the captives as they came back in chains that once they were mighty, but now they had been captive. They saw the treasure that came from those conquests. They saw foreign kings in chains. They saw generals receiving the adoration of the emperor himself. In the wake of the army was a broken and subjugated people. And that's how the Roman Empire was built, through conquering. As they stood before those great armies, they knew with great confidence that theirs was the victory from the very outset of the battle. They didn't fight it to lose or so that they wouldn't lose. They fought the battle as if they had already won. And that's the attitude that Paul is expressing in our text this morning. To those who knew conquerors, he invited them to be more than conquerors. To be more than the great generals that they saw at the head of one of the greatest armies in the world. He said, you are more than they are. Because they lead an earthly army. But yours is a spiritual battle. And a spiritual battle that you must win. And you will win and you can win. And so the purpose of this lesson this morning is to inspire confidence in us. Because of the world that we live in, it's, it, it seems that we're bombarded from every side. And it seems that the message to us is that you've lost the battle and we've won. But I'm here to tell you this morning that that is a lie. That they're trying to get you to believe that they believe that the more that they say it, the more that we'll believe it. And you know they're right if we're not careful. 
If we keep hearing the message that God did not create the world, that it just came into being on its own, and you hear a hundred years, a hundred million years, a billion years, two billion years, five billion years, and you hear that over and over and over and over again, as our children do in school, as we hear it on television and other things, we hear it so often that we begin to believe it. We hear uh, people who are so vocal about their belief in abortion and homosexuality and, and all these other things that they're trying to, to force on us, that, that they're so loud and forceful that they must be right. And we know that that's not the case. So how do we face them? What tools, what weapons do we need in order to be successful in a world that is seeking to defeat us? How do we handle that? How can we be more than conquerors? Well, the first thing that we need to do is we need to breach the wall of sin. If you're going to get into and attack a city, if you're going to be successful in conquering that territory, you have to get into the wall. You have to break it down. Some way, somehow, you have to get into the defensive position or the offensive position to get into that city. Sin is our wall that we've got to break through. Isaiah talked about that in Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, where he said, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities, sins, have separated you from God, or your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. If we're ever going to be conquerors in the world, we've got to break through the wall of sin, our own wall of sin, that separates us from God. If we're going to be more than conquerors, we have to get rid of the weight that is weighing us down and keeping us from being who God wants us to be. Who he envisioned us to be from the very beginning, and that is his child. He wants us in his family. He wants us in his army, if you will. That is breaking down the wall of sin. That is foregoing the, the, the safe life back way behind the trenches and is seeking to be on the front line to break that wall of sin down. Every victorious army that ever marched is condemned in the end unless sin is conquered. Unless we conquer our sin through the blood of Jesus Christ, we will be defeated. The army will break through. The, the devil is seeking whom he may devour at this moment. Like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. The enemy is there. The enemy is in the world. It is in the devil. He is seeking to destroy us. But we must break down that wall of sin. Our marching orders cover the matter of the forgiveness of sins. Here's what we're told to do and how we're told to do it. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Those are our orders. Jesus gave that to us. Sometimes we call that the Great Commission. It even has a, a military connotation to it. That it is our job to break down that wall of sin by teaching the world who Jesus is, making disciples, and baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Not only must we break down the wall of sin, the second thing we have to do is we have to wield the best 
weapons. Now to wield, that's not a word we use very often. That's not something on your car or on your wheelbarrow. It's something different. To wield something means that you know how to use it. That you have this sword or other type of weapon in your hand and you know how to use it properly because you've been trained to do so. You've practiced it so that in the heat of battle, you can use it as it was intended to use. Now, let's say you're, you're a soldier, and you're going into battle, and you have a weapon that you've never fired, you've never used, you've never practiced with, you don't know where all the buttons and the switches and all that go. And you get into the worst firefight of your life, and, and you don't know what to do. Well, you know what's going to happen. Unless someone comes and rescues you, you are going to be defeated. So you know how, you have to know how to use the weapons. What weapons? Mighty weapons that Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse four, where he says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or of this world, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. We, we don't have the type of weapons that we're going to run out of ammunition. We're not going to become, uh, uh, we're not going to lack the strength to be able to, to throw it properly or shoot it straight. Those are not the weapons that we use. The weapon that we use is this. It's God's word. And they'll tell you that it doesn't matter, that this is irrelevant, that it is not inspired, that it's just a bunch of writing from a bunch of old men uh, thousands of years ago. How in the world could you believe that? That's what they'll say. But we know that our weapon is mighty, that it is powerful, and we better know how to use it. We better know how to wield it and be ready to give an answer for the hope that is within us so that when that time comes, and it will, that we'll know that our weapon is mighty, unlike the weapons of this world. And then you know the classic text from Ephesians chapter 6, when we're talking about putting on the whole armor of God, where Paul said, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, and then the power of his might. Do you get it? Do you hear what he's saying? I think so many times that we become mealy mouth. You know what that means? Y'all ever use that expression before? Well, I don't, I don't know if I can do it. I, I don't. I, uh, uh, uh. And we become whiners. And we become quitters. And we become losers because we don't recognize the power of God in this world. And it angers me. I'm sorry. But I get hot when I think about that. When we, when we turn to the world and we say, well, they must be right because there's so many of them. And he's given us the armor. He's given us the weapons to use. He's given us everything we need to be successful in this fight against evil. But yet we choose not to put it on. Why is that? Maybe we're not brave enough. Maybe we don't have the courage. Maybe we don't stick to it like we should. Verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith 
with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We, we stand on the front line. We are prepared with the whole armor of God. And we say to the world, bring it. I'm ready. You may kill my body, but you will not kill my soul. You will come at me with everything you've got and I can take it. Because God is on my side and I'm wearing his army. Uh, armor. I'm using his weapons, not mine. And he's got anything you can dish out taken care of. And that's the attitude that we have to have. If we're ever going to be successful, no army can do it without it. The third thing we've got to do is we've got to follow orders. That's hard to do. Some of you have been in the service before. Sometimes you're given an order that you don't like, that you think is dumb, that you think is the, the craziest thing that you've ever heard, but because it's an order, you've got to do it. You're required to do it, actually. When that officer gives you that order, you're required to follow it. As a member of God's army, we have to follow orders as well. Think about Christ as our captain. He is our leader. He is the one giving the orders. Hebrews 2 verse 10. For it was fitting for him, that's a capital H, meaning Christ, for whom are all things and by whom are all things. It means he created everything that is. In bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Sometimes when, when you're in the service and you're taking orders, sometimes you don't like those orders because they don't make sense. Jesus will never give us an order like that. He never gives us an order in his word that is going to harm us, that is going to separate us from salvation, that is ever going to cause anything bad to happen spiritually to us. And we can have confidence in that. When we obey orders, we know that good things will happen. When we are obedient to our captain, we know that we'll be victorious. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8, Though he was the son, speaking of Jesus, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. That next to the last word, that's the tough one. We know what the orders are. We know that the orders are good. But are we going to follow those orders? No army is successful in their objective if those orders are not followed. If everybody makes up their own as they go, we will not work in unison. We will not work as one unit. We will not work to win the goal, which is to win. Not only must we follow orders, we must fight. You know, we can have the best weapons. We can break down the wall of sin. We can have the best weapons. We can follow orders. But if we stay on the sidelines, if we stay in the trench and we don't fight, then the battle can't be won. We've got to get out there and do it. What are we fighting for? We're fighting for the richest treasure. You show, you show me somebody that doesn't have an objective to fight for, and I'll show you someone who's going to lose. When we, when we have something to fight for, we have a greater chance of winning. Mark 8, 36 and 37. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul, or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Our soul is the prize. It is what we're fighting for. It is what we have to give everything for to make sure that our soul is saved. 
Also, we're fighting for a crown of life. According to Revelation 2, verse 10, it says, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. The, the crown of life seems sometimes so far away, doesn't it? It, it almost it seems that we forget about it, that it just seems almost too good to be true. Just out of reach. But it's there to those that are faithful. Even though you can't see it, you believe it because God said it was so, then that victory will be yours. But if we're going to get that, we're going to have to fight. It won't be easy. It'll be hard. But it'll be a good fight. For Paul told Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold or fight for eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Fight. Another word I don't want to think about is contend. In Jude 3 it says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation... I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Not only must we fight, but we must see the victory. We must stay, we must stand, and we must fight. To see the victory, finally, we got to stick in it when nobody else is. When everybody else says that it can't be done, you've got to say, it can. It will. God said it. I believe it. It's going to happen. Everybody else is calling you crazy. You're sitting there putting your armor on, getting ready for battle, getting ready to go out the door to face the world that's trying to defeat you. But you're going to win because God said you would. I think of the classic text about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 58, where Paul said, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Now death is the only thing that the world really has that they think is going to kill Christianity. That's what radical Muslims are trying to do all over the world. And ISIS and all those, they're trying to use death as a way to destroy that which is good. But death has already been whooped by Jesus himself. Oh death, where is your sting? Oh Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. What's he saying? He's saying you've got this. The victory is won. Death has been beaten. And you've got it. Revelation 21, verses 1 through 7. John saw something incredible that he had never seen before in his life. And he has been given this privilege to see this thing and try to relate it to us 
through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And here he said, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. In the wake of the Lord's army is sin and death, and up ahead is triumph. The Bible pictures the Christian life in terms of great inten intensity, a race, a fight, a battle. Imagine yourself at the end. All in, didn't retreat, didn't step back, did everything you could. Did you? Did I? Will you be more than conquerors? Or will you be conquered? That's the question we have to answer in our life. You're one or the other. You're either conquered or you're the conqueror. But Jesus said, Paul said in Romans, you can be more than conquerors. How? Through Jesus Christ. And that's it. Will you be more than conquerors today? Christians who are here, have we been fighting the good fight of faith? Or have we been sitting in the back, retreating to the place of safety where there is no hurt, there is no pain, and there is no life. Get in the fight. For those of us who are not Christians this morning, we're not in the fight at all. Actually, we're among the defeated because we haven't broken through the wall of sin that separates us from God. You can do that by believing that Jesus is the Son of God, repenting of your sin, confessing that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and being baptized for the remission of sins. And then live a life that is faithful, putting on the whole armor of God, standing at the front of the front in the battle line and defeating sin, defeating Satan with every swing of your spiritual sword. Will you do that this morning? If you need to come and respond to the Lord's invitation, we hope that you do that now, today, as we stand and sing. Dear soul.